Hi everyone, I'm Anu Katharason, fertility physician and doctor mom, and here to educate on fertility. There are different types of frozen embryo transfer protocols. In this video, we'll be talking about the stimulated frozen embryo transfer protocol. So let's start that discussion now. Prior to proceeding with a stimulated frozen embryo transfer cycle, first we want to make sure the goals from the IVF cycle were met meaning that the couple are happy with the number of embryos and the sex of the embryos for their particular family building goals. So assuming that is the case, then the other things we wanna make sure we have taken care of before proceeding with the cycle is also uh, uterine cavity evaluation. And that can be done either with a saline ultrasound, a FEMBU, or a hysteroscopy. We just wanna make sure that the uterus is nice and normal before we put the embryo back in. The last thing we often will want to do is what's called a mock transfer or a trial transfer. It's basically a practice run at putting the embryo back in. We just don't want to run into any surprise on the real day when we're putting the embryo back in. After all these things are done, then we're ready to proceed with the stimulated frozen embryo transfer cycle. The premise of the cycle is we are giving medications to help the woman grow two or three follicles, and then we will trigger ovulation. And then we will time the transfer at a particular time after ovulation is triggered. So we're basically piggybacking off of the woman's cycle. Medications that she could take to help grow the follicles are Clomid, Letrozole, um, injections like gonadotropins or sometimes a combination of these things. Some of the advantages and disadvantages of this type of cycle. So an advantage is that because we are piggybacking off of the woman's cycle, she is making hormones herself. She'll be making estrogen and progesterone. So because of that, we can get away with giving less medications, meaning no IM shots compared to the medicated frozen embryo transfer protocol. So that's an advantage. But some disadvantages are that there's less flexibility with the cycle. So for example, if a woman is wanting to time or transfer on a specific day, there's less of a guarantee with that because it's really going to be dependent on when the follicle reaches the right size and when we trigger ovulation. In addition, sometimes the follicle gets big and is ready to ovulate, but the lining may not be at the appropriate thickness. And sometimes there's not additional time to allow that lining to get thicker before that woman ovulates. And in those situations, we have to cancel the cycle. So that's an example of the disadvantage of this cycle. The pregnancy rates are similar amongst all the protocols, so there's not necessarily a right or wrong path, but please discuss with your healthcare physician what would be best for you in your particular case. Now we'll go over the steps of a stimulated frozen embryo transfer cycle. The first step in a stimulated frozen embryo transfer cycle is we'll have the patient call with their period. And then we'll bring them in around cycle day two to four for baseline ultrasound and blood work, making sure everything looks good to start. Then we'll start them on medication to help them grow ideally two to three follicles. That medication could be Clomid, it could be Letrozole, it could be injections, or it could be a combination of pills and injections. And then we'll bring them in a little bit later on in the cycle approximately cycle day 10 to 12, and look at how many follicles have responded, but particularly the thickness of the lining of the uterus. There are two things in particular we're looking at. The thickness, so the thickness can vary in terms of the threshold clinic to clinic, but generally around seven millimeters in size is our goal. And then we're also looking at the characteristics of the lining. We want a trilaminar appearance, it's a particular three-line appearance. So once we achieve a certain size of the follicles and that thickness of the lining and the characteristic of the lining, then we will trigger ovulation. And then we'll plan for the embryo transfer to be approximately seven days after the trigger. We will also have the patient start estrogen and progesterone a few days after the trigger. This leads me to the embryo transfer. The embryo will be thawed that morning and there's approximately a 95% survival rate for the embryo to survive the thaw. The next concern is how many embryos do we put back in? Nowadays, we do a lot of genetic testing, and so this has dramatically increased our success rates that we usually will recommend putting one embryo back in at a time. But every patient's clinical history is different, so please discuss this with your healthcare provider. The next thing is how we actually do the procedure. I have done a video on the embryo transfer, and I will link it here, and also preparation for the embryo transfer. But to briefly summarize, you'll come in that day with a full bladder. Some clinics don't use any anesthesia. Some use oral Valium. Either is really okay. 
and we will put a speculum in, perform a gentle lavage, and then advance a soft catheter into the cervix and in the uterus, and then deposit the embryo near the top of the uterus, and then we'll gently remove the catheter. Patients will then rest for about 20 to 30 minutes before they'll get up and leave the clinic that day. The last step is checking the pregnancy test. We usually check the pregnancy test anywhere from 9 to 14 days after the embryo transfer. If the pregnancy test is positive, we'll repeat it 48 hours later and we're looking for an appropriate rise in that baby HCG. If we see that appropriate rise, then we are reassured and we'll go ahead and schedule the first OB ultrasound around six weeks of gestation, which is approximately two weeks from when we check that initial beta HCG. Patients will also continue the medication. In this scenario, the patient did ovulate and does have a corpus luteum making estrogen and progesterone. So typically we stop the medications a little earlier in this type of protocol compared to the medicated frozen embryo transfer protocol. And that can vary clinic to clinic, but it can go to approximately eight weeks of gestation. If the beta HCG rise is not appropriate, then we're concerned if the pregnancy might be a miscarriage or might be an ectopic pregnancy. So we will keep a closer eye on these patients and bring them in for blood work and ultrasound earlier. The last scenario would be if the beta HCG was negative. If this were to be the case, we'll have the patient stop the medication and then we'll schedule a follow-up visit where we'll go over next steps from there. That is it for this video. Please remember that every patient is different, so please discuss your own clinical history with your provider to determine which protocol might be best for you. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, I hope you'll give the video a like. Don't forget to subscribe down below. If you have comments or questions, you can leave them for me there also. Thank you again so much for watching and see you in the next video.